next to these, let's say, these physical, um, well, let's say, the systems and components, we also uh, organize uh, PLD courses. So before Corona, we would always have a yearly PLD course. Uh, we would invite students to come over to ne the Netherlands. And we have a course of about three days. Uh, where they learn everything about PLD. So um, Guus is also involved in giving lectures on, on PLD and we would work on the systems here uh, at, at the labs. Yeah, and actually since Corona, we also started these type of webinars. So if you, if, as a replacement of the course. So if you go to our website, you can actually already see also some webinar recordings where we go into uh, more detail regarding the uh, yeah, PLD uh, pr process, but also scientific outputs uh, by our uh, customers. So it's really, uh, yeah, the, the components, the systems, but also uh, the knowledge, which we'd like to, uh, to uh, express. So briefly about how we work. So first of all, it, it, the, main, the main starting point is, of course, you have a lot of contact with the customer. You really like to identify all their, their interests, their, their requirements in terms of system uh, properties. And we translate this to a nice design. We, we go into design. Um, we purchase all the components, so we don't necessarily make anything on site. We really have for every single component, we have our supplier base, but we do a full assembly of the system. So the system will be fully constructed in our, uh, on our work floor. We develop uh, dedicated software for the system for control of everything and a full testing uh, of the system. Um, and, in the, and it all finishes, of course, with the uh, sh shipment of the system and a full installation at the customer where we really show it's a full assembly, a full installation, but also showing an actual PLD run where we grow a few films and show electron diffraction if it's included in the, in the system. So also, also, it's really kind of a training of the of the of the students. Just briefly going into the the, the machine itself. So it's all about a, it, it, the, the core is a, is a vacuum chamber. You, you want to work in a clean environment. Uh, which is always custom designed. So we can add ports wherever you want. We can prepare the system for future upgrades, um, load logs, etc. cetera. Uh, gas handling, so in PLD is really important to control your parameter space and pr the process pressure in the chamber is, is an important uh, uh, parameter, um, which is nicely controlled by mass flow controllers and pump speed control to have a continuous fresh flow of, of uh, mostly oxygen in the in the chamber, um, well, heating, and again, like these are topics I can I, I can talk much more about. So please, if you have any further questions, uh, just just contact us to and to know more about this. Uh, several ways of heating a sample, uh, depending on the size of the sample, the temperature requirements, uh, radiation heating, laser heating, contact heating. Uh, we go up to four inch uh, wafer scale heating. Um, the challenge is always making it compatible with read. So the manipulator um, needs to have as many degrees of freedom necessary to do good read studies, always oxygen compatible. Um, so yeah, a lot of possibilities really trying to adapt to the needs of the, of the customer. Target handling, so the nice part of PLD is having several targets in the chamber, being able to switch quickly between uh, targets in a well-controlled way for growth of uh, heterostructures, all controlled by the software. And uh, of course, uh, reflective high energy electron diffraction, uh, developed here in Twente actually by Guus. Um, you can really take this credit uh, for, for developing uh, high pressure reads, which is a differentially pumped engineering design, making it possible to do electron diffraction also at higher oxygen pressures in the chamber. Um, and these higher oxygen pressures are typically needed for, for growth of good um, uh, metal oxides in, uh, in PLD. Um, and from an engineering point of view, I mean, read is very sensitive. So we always try to um, make solutions, limiting vibration, electromagnetic interference, uh, et cetera. Um, and optics is also a very important parameter, of course. It's all about ablation of material. So you introduce a UV pulse into the system. So with, uh, with, with um, optical components, you guide the beam uh, in a well-controlled way into the system. You image the beam uh, to have a uh, well-controlled fluence on the target, easy to adjust, um, et cetera. Uh, and flexible layout. So we are, uh, the customized approach is also really adapting. Uh, often often lab, lab floors are limited in, in size. So we can, we can, we are flexible in, 
in adapting our designs according to uh, floor plans and and software of course uh, important feature it's always a challenge because again the systems are custom every system is unique so you need to develop the software uniquely for uh, individual systems um possibility right to write recipes so all the automated parts of the system can be programmed uh parameter logging so if things go wrong we can easily go, look back into a logging um, of, of uh, the parameters to see what went, what went wrong and again so uh, next to pld we also are experienced in in making cluster tools uh, connecting pld to other uh, deposition techniques uh, we are compatible with conventional uh, sample holder platforms uh, etc so a lot possible some nice examples of, of these type of custom custom designs can, uh, uh, so here on the left top, uh, a nice example of having three systems connected to one laser. You design the optics in such a way that you can quickly switch between the systems. Um, the system in India, actually one of two systems that we have currently in India, Bhubaneswar. Uh, a nice example of having the system on a bakeout platform, uh, which is if you really want to go to ultra high vacuum, 10 minus 10 millibars of pressure, you uh, you need to do a thorough bakeout. So the system will be placed on the on the table, you can wrap a tent around it and really have a very homogeneous uh, bake out. The system in France, a nice example of having a evaporation chamber with a PLD system connected by a load lock. And also I'd like to point out this um, is a product that we're recently uh, shipped to, to uh, DTU Denmark. It's a transfer line, six meters, connecting four PLD systems, a sputter chamber. So this is also now a product that we are uh, uh, have developed and. Um, and it could be interesting uh, to connect multiple systems, which we see more and more, uh, more often. Um, currently, uh, over 100 systems worldwide, uh, many, of course, in Europe um, and in China. And we see more and more activity uh, also definitely in, in India, in, in the US. So currently two systems at the Institute of Physics in Bhubaneswar and uh, ISER in, in uh, Berhampur. Um, and uh, we are indeed marked leader in uh, the high-end systems as, uh, as Sandeepta also introduced. And some nice pictures. So full installation on site, we always have the customer to join the installation to, to really get familiarize themselves with the systems. Uh, we used to go to conferences kind of showing uh, what we are all about. Um, some nice picture of having a system integrated to a transfer line. And that's uh, kind of, um yeah my introduction on the company again it's 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 quick um please contact us if you have any further questions and then i'd like to go a little bit into detail um regarding pld as the deposition technique itself so a little bit more of a fundamental um talk now so indeed developed in the in the 60s as a physical vapor deposition technique we're really following the, the development of, of high power lasers essentially so when with this development people could start uh, interacting these lasers with with materials and you could see these uh, this ablation starting to happen um very useful for high melting point ceramics um and especially with complex stoichiometry um, so that's kind of already bulleting the, the main features of pld it's mainly this stoichiometric transfer of materials so you can simply start with a uh uh, and it doesn't have to be a crystalline target, but just a powder, a synthetic powder target with all the, let's say, atoms in the right stoichiometry uh, ratio uh, in, in the target. And by the process of PLD, uh, by the ablation, you, you form this plume with all these, uh, these particles you put in your target, and it crystallizes onto, um, onto your substrate in the right conditions. You, you get this near stoichiometric transfer of, this, um, of these materials mainly due to the, the high supersaturation nature of, of the plume, many nucleation sites, which cause uh, the crystalline film to grow. And due to the, this high supersaturation and, and many nucleation points, it's also very uh, proven to be very um, a good technique to grow volatile species uh, that tend to stick better even at higher uh, temperatures. Um, because you have many parameters to tune, you can, for instance, tune the, the, the kinetic energy of species by playing with the, 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 the process gas in the, in the chamber. Um, 
of course, having structured growth, um, simply because physically you can switch very quickly between targets. You can just shoot a few pulses from one target, switch to the other, and, and in this way build up heterostructures. And especially the development of uh, electron diffraction um, during growth gave control of really having single monolayers uh, and really building up these stacks of, of a few monolayers of, of materials, which I will show uh, uh, in my next slides. So kind of a, to get a picture for people that, that are not entirely familiar with the process, it's a very, as you can see in the, in the video, very explosive process. So the plume, it, it's really an explosion of material. So it's, it's quite interesting that we actually achieved, achieved this, this, this high control uh, in, in film growth, because in essence, it's a very, it looks like a very uncontrolled process. So um, to, to kind of break it down, so what is, what is PLD in, in the major components? You start with an, uh, a UV laser. Typically, the excimer laser is, is, is mostly used, uh, having the, the high power you need. So the piece of optics where you introduce the pulse onto the target. And in a vacuum chamber, you have the target and the substrate. These are essentially what it all comes down to. And in this process, you have a few important parameters that you'd like to tune to find your right optimum for, for the film that you're growing. Um, and these are mainly the, the energy density of the pulse onto the target, the pulse frequency, the amount of pulses, and therefore the amount of material you're ablating. Uh, the background gas, so for oxides, you typically work with, ox uh, with oxygen in the chamber, but you can also introduce nitrogen or, or ar argon. Mixtures are interesting. The substrate temperature, of course, and, and also to some extent the shape and the spot uh, of the, the pulse onto the target. And from a TSST point of view, so we, we really develop the systems in such a way that you can really nicely control these parameters. Because in the end, it's, it's all about the reproducibility. So as I will show, the PLD still, although straightforward in its mechanism, there are still many unknowns. We don't entirely understand what all these parameters exactly do in terms of how they affect the plume and subsequently the film. So as an experimentalist, the main thing is you want to be able to reproduce and therefore reproduce um, your parameters. You need to be sure that from run to run, parameters stay constant. And this is really the engineering challenge for us uh, as, as TSST. So this is a kind of a nice showcase of, of what PLD really is capable of. So what you can see here is a tr transmission electron microscopy, microscopy image of um, 120 alternating layers of strontium titanate and lanthanum strontium manganite. And this is kind of a zoom in and basically the experiment was growing four monolayers of one uh, material, switching to switching targets and growing four monolayers of the other one. And this really showed you could maintain this control over 120 alternating layers. So it really shows the, 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 yeah, the potential and the, the, the possibilities with, with PLD and having this control on, uh, on atomic um, level. So a bit of history indeed, as, as Sandeep mentioned, in the 80s there was a big breakthrough and especially regarding the, uh, the, the stoichiometric transfer. So in the 80s it was shown that um, um, were the first films of uh, yttrium barium copper oxide, which is a high TC superconductor. They were synthesized um, by PLD, but using a single bulk material target. That's kind of important to mention. So they use a center target with all the elements inside. They grew a film and this, this thin film was, was superconducting. And that was kind of an indication of uh, a very high um, stoichiometric and, and crystalline quality of these films. Um, so the fact that the film became superconducting was kind of a proof that these films are a high quality and have the, 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 the right stoichiometry. And after this really uh, PLD uh, yeah, kind of experienced a breakthrough in, um, in the scientific community. And people started to, to investigate um, PLD also more from a fundamental point of view in the sense that what, what is actually happening? So because it's an explosive process, but what is really happening. And it starts all with, with the plume, essentially, you ablate material. And, and what does this plume actually look like? What's the composition? Um, also work with I, which I actually did during my PhD, looking with high-speed cameras at the plume. So here on the left side, so you can see a nice expanding uh, plume. And here on the right side, you can actually see a spectrum. So the light of the plume is spectrally resolved. And that actually gives you an indication of the composition of the plume. 
and uh, so propagation direction in so you see when the plume is propagating towards the substrate you see the colors the lines changing uh, which is an indication of the fact that species are oxidizing during this process so from this work we really know that it's it's not too trivial a lot of chemistry is also happening um, and a certain matter of oxidation already happens in the plume of course, very material dependent, and, and but also affecting in the end of film that you're growing. We know a lot about timelines, so absorption of light, uh, target light interaction is, is picosecond work, but the pulse itself from the laser is nanoseconds, so there is already a lot of physics happening there. Uh, the plume expansion happens after uh, picoseconds, but then the expansion itself is, is microseconds before it arrives at the substrate. All parameter dependent, so it's, it's quite a complex process when you really start to, to dive into this. Um, and then, okay, that's, that's, that's the plume, so to say. Uh, then film growth. So an important other development was, as I mentioned, the, the development of high pressure uh, reflective high energy electron. Uh, diffraction, which was developed by by Guus in uh, here at the University of Twente. Uh, basically, you have an electron gun at a grazing incident, which interacts with the substrate, and you collect a diffraction pattern, which kind of looks like this when you optimize it. Um, and what people observed is that, especially this this specular spot, um, zero order diffraction, would show in certain conditions kind of an oscillating intensity behavior. And by modeling this, by understanding growth, um, it was clear that you were actually looking at, roughly speaking, uh, roughening and smoothing of, of the film. So actually growing single monolayers. So an, an oscillation here, uh, can I show this video? An oscillation would really represent a single monolayer of growth. And we started to model this. There is a lot of information in there. So you, can, you could actually observe the single pulses uh, so first, the, the surface would get rougher, but you also, when you zoom in, you can see that after a single pulse, uh, the, the intensity was a recovering, which gives an indication of all sorts of kinetic processes on the surface, particles moving uh, at, before they nucleate. A lot of information with this technique, and, and in the end also just simply resulted in, in the fact that we can really grow uh, single monolayers on top of each other for certain materials in certain conditions. That's always important to mention. But that's really um, yeah, what gave us the atomic control in, in PLD. I think I need to slightly hurry up now. So uh, let me uh, therefore at some point summarize a, a nice example of, of this control. You start with a substrate of strontium titanate, you grow, let's say 10 layers of lanthanum aluminate, you introduce one uh, strontium copper oxide layer. On top of this uh, strontium titanate, it's kind of an interesting stack uh, within the LAO STO um, research where the, the strontium copper oxide would enhance uh, oxygen diffusion and stuff. So this really shows yeah, we have this atomic control opening up all sorts of interesting physics about thin films, but also about interfaces between uh, these materials. So, um, yeah, and that now, yeah, all these developments kind of gives us this very simplistic, let's say, um, model of, of PLD really became a tool where you can grow, where, where you can understand crystals in terms of Lego blocks and you can build these Lego block layer. Sounds ch childish, but actually this, this analogy made it into uh, nature. So the, the son of Goes actually built this, <laughs> made this picture, and, uh, and it, it made it in an overview article about, uh, about perovskite growth um, in, in nature. So it's quite a, quite a nice, um, nice model, nice analogy. Um, and there I can finish up. So hopefully kind of a clear picture on, on what we do as, as a company. Uh, the, the developments of PLD that made PLD, let's say, uh, a very interesting and widely used uh, technique. It's for fundamental research. So we have atomic control, um, in this case for complex oxides, uh, but also for a wide variety of other materials that are being applied now also uh, in terms of applications. So sensors, energy harvesters, uh, battery uh, research, etc. cetera. Um, and there I'd like to finish up. Uh, and Guus can uh, pick it up from me, but I guess uh, we can first have some questions. So maybe Sandipta. Uh, yes, we have, uh, now we have now one question from uh, uh, Swarupati Pragya. Uh, she's asking when the laser falls on target after some time, there should be, uh, there should occur a hole on target then. Then how could you take care of that? 
It's basically the rustering and rotating of the target. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. So uh, indeed, um, if you look at the numbers, you ablate much more material than actually you, you're collecting on, on the on the substrate. So just after a yeah, significant amount of pulses, you will start drilling into the target. So you need to move the target surface with respect to the laser pulse. Absolutely essential. Uh, conventionally, people would do this by rotating, having the target spin. And in this way, you kind of drill a circular shape into the target. Um, we offer both, but we actually liked uh, both in the sense that we do spinning, but actually our preference is having the targets on a X, Y, Z manipulator and moving the target in an X, Y direction. Engineering wise. And that's what we call rastering or scanning indeed. And, and we personally find it slightly more interesting because you have less rotating parts, uh, therefore less outgassing in the chamber, uh, less vibrations. And it's kind of a, also a, a more simple, straightforward stage. And you can use, uh, you don't have to use uh, round shaped targets anymore. You can actually use small targets because you have this control where you are able to make small scan movements, all programmed in the software. So you can set your scan area. Uh, so um, yeah, so yeah, the engineering solutions are there. It's and definitely an important uh, remark indeed. You need to prevent uh, the drilling. No, no, no. Basically, we can use all parts of the uh, target. Yes, I would put it that way. Yeah, yes, exactly. And uh, I mean, there are th th targets thinkable that are quite expensive. You, you want to just get a small piece or a quick run or whatever. You could actually um, a blade from substrates, arguably single crystal. Uh, so the scanning approach gives you just more flexibility. And it's again, also for, for your uh, vacuum conditions, it's, it's cleaner. There are no moving parts inside the vacuum. So. And the whole okay. carousel, the targets so can be exchanged. Have one more yeah, sure. Uh, we have one question. One more question. Uh, yeah. Is there anything we can do in the software by uh, or by any other means to avoid plasma shielding? Plasma, say again. Plasma shielding. 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 To avoid uh, uh, plasma shielding. Yeah. So I guess you're referring to any contamination that will happen. Uh, by the plasma, I mean, you're collecting it on the substrate, but there is a lot of plasma and, and material being. Yeah, so you, you need to consider what, what your goal would be. So uh, depending on the kind of the geometry, we shield the targets, um, but you always do pre-ablation studies uh, in the sense that you clean your target, you shoot at the target before you start to run. But you could, yeah, so the material will get everywhere. Uh, and if you don't like that, you can have solutions like shutters on, on viewports, et cetera. You need to clean your laser entrance port occasionally uh, because you get contamination on, on parts, but it's it's ceramics. So you kind of need to think about what, what how you're contaminating the chamber uh, yeah. and whether- Rick, Rick, uh, Rick and, uh, and or organizer, uh, can I ask for a favor? Uh, because uh, after this meeting, I have to hurry towards uh, uh, a defense committee where I'm part okay. of. So, and there are many questions. So maybe we can uh, address sure. those questions afterwards. And then I can start sure. my- Sure, sure, sure Because latest I have to, uh, to move, uh, let's say uh, 12, 10 or so here. So uh, that's why. Sorry. Okay. Sure. Yeah. We'll, address, we'll address the question uh, after uh, this uh, after your session and if yeah, time sure. permits we'll address everyone otherwise we'll we are collecting the emails so that we will uh, give a reply to the questions to the individuals yeah exactly yep, yep. And now right. professor goes so you see my slides yes okay perfect so um, thank you very much uh, for uh, well giving this opportunity uh, to uh, to um, well show some of our uh, results. Um, so what I would like to do in this uh, uh, presentation is um, not to show all the stuff that uh, Rick already showed because uh, let's say PLD has a long history already, not only in our lab but uh, worldwide and also in India. Uh, what I would like to do is to focus a bit on, uh, um, let's say, device fabrication uh, using, well, ferroelectric and piezoelectric materials, because I think it's also uh, interesting to show that uh, PLD now also made it to uh, 
let's say, uh, fabrication of real devices and actually also devices that are uh, in use now uh, in, in, in companies. But I will give a, um, well, an introduction uh, a bit wider first before I get into that. So, and let me uh, uh, also then, um, well, show our uh, research group, Inorganic Material Science here at the University of Twente, which I'm heading. And what you can see uh, from this slide already is that, um, um, let's say we focus already on a lot of uh, applications, whether it is uh, spintronics, uh, batteries, thermoelectrics, uh, catalysis, photonics, nanoelectronics, neuromorphic memories, and, and many more. So where I uh, started, uh, well, around uh, 30 years ago already on, on uh, high TC superconductors and, and, and trying to make uh, superconducting uh, thin films and devices, and later on to two ducks in LEOSTO and multiferroic materials, uh, magnetic materials, uh, ferroelectric materials. Uh, the PLD technique um, is now being used for a lot of studies in, for, for very well, different uh, applications. Well, uh, let's see, I have to click here. So, and just to show you a few examples. So here you see a cross section of a uh, solid state uh, thin film battery completely made by uh, uh, pulse laser deposition, where you see uh, both electrodes and the electrolyte in the middle. And actually these uh, devices show very good performance. So you can make very dense uh, films. So not uh, everything is atomically controlled, but actually what uh, this group does is uh, atomically control the interfaces between those uh, electrolytes and, 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 and the cathode and anode materials. So this is uh, very well controlled, as you can see over here. And this interface is also being engineered, as we do also with many other model-like uh, systems. Well, just recently, um, uh, Dr. Chris Boimer uh, uh, got into our group. And uh, he is going to use the thin film for uh, electrocatalysis. Uh, uh, and this is just a schematic view where we will do XPS operando at uh, liquid uh, solid uh, interfaces. And what he tries to do is to make these model-like, uh, let's say, uh, material systems and, and show that these can work uh, for electrocatalysis. One also other interesting thing is that we work also on hybrid materials, so organic inorganic materials. Whereas uh, the idea is to use uh, different lasers, different uh, uh, materials, and uh, well, um, the, such a movie was already shown by Rick, but now you can also uh, imagine that you use different uh, materials, different lasers to uh, have a layer by layer uh, um, fabrication of uh, also organic inorganic uh, thin films and this relates also to one of the questions that i saw in 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 the, the chat uh, on the ablation on very um, well uh, materials like uh, polymeric uh, uh, substrate etc so post laser deposition has the advantage that you can operate it at uh, relatively high pressures and what you do is you thermalize the particles when they arrive at the substrate surface so that means that you can even um, deposit uh, materials on, 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 on substrates or thin films that are actually um, very prone to uh, uh, deterioration or by, um, by, by high energetic particles. We can thermalize them and we can kind of what we show as a soft landing technique on, uh, on such, a, such a material, whether it's a substrate or the thin film. So some of these pictures you have seen, uh, I think in the, let's say the last uh, 20 years or so, the lessons learned is that uh, we can control thin film growth at the atomic scale. You need uh, very well controlled, uh, uh, let's say, uh, substrate services. You need uh, to have in situ control. We have kind of understanding of the growth mechanisms, nucleation and growth. And we also understand the role of chemistry and physics of uh, the deposited particles, as was mentioned by, by Rick as well. And with that, we are able to, uh, by growing thin films, we can tune properties of complex oxide materials. And this is a very uh, busy slide, but uh, here you can show that you have uh, several uh, freedoms um, to, to, to change the, the, the properties of the materials by uh, changing the crystalline properties of such materials. So by straining it, by using uh, different thicknesses, by changing the, the symmetry uh, in, in such materials. And uh, so there is a, a huge freedom 
to tune uh, these complex oxide materials. And this is uh, just an, uh, a few uh, examples where we did it. So uh, unfortunately on the, uh, the picture on the right hand side, where you can see the, uh, uh, let's say uh, a stack of uh, lanthanum titanate and lanthanum cobaltite, where we have uh, electronic reconstructions at the uh, interface and uh, thereby changing the properties of these materials. Um, in the middle, uh, you can see where we uh, made uh, lanthanum sans manganate. And by uh, tuning the interfaces, we could uh, tune the, in the, the symmetry in these manganates and therefore change the uh, magnetic anisotropy in such materials. And last but not least, and I think that's very interesting that nowadays uh, we can combine different uh, uh, deposition techniques and also get, uh, for instance, uh, uh, quite good growth of epitaxial oxides on top of silicon. And later on, I will also show that we can do that also on 3.5 substrate and even on glass. Um, Okay, let's move to uh, to some of uh, the, the projects that we did in the past on, on piezoelectric uh, uh, materials. So what you can see here in the bottom is a, uh, uh, a thin film device made out of a PCT stack, uh, fully epitaxially grown on, on the silicon, and then machined in such a way that you can uh, move this uh, membrane by uh, piezoelectric uh, actuation. And uh, nowadays uh, there are PLD tools available uh, where you can grow on, on 10 centimeters or 100 millimeters. And even uh, there are systems available where you can go up to 300 millimeters or so. And that also means that now you really can make uh, a sort of a manufacturing readiness level is such that we can integrate such complex materials in, in real devices. And this is what we did already for, for a long time. And here you can see some examples of a, a multi-purpose wafers where we made uh, energy scavengers, actuators, uh, uh, piezo uh, uh, micro machines, uh, ultrasound devices. And with that, we collaborate quite a lot with uh, uh, several companies. Uh, and, and still important there is to, for us at least as an academic group, is to try to understand the properties of, uh, for instance, this uh, lead zirconium titanate uh, uh, piezoelectric thin films and how strain and other effects uh, affect the functionality of these films in a real device. Uh, so um, we, we, what we did is uh, we made these ferroelectric and piezoelectric oxides on oxides, on silicon, on glass, and 3.5 uh, materials. And in that, uh, uh, let's say strain engineering is very important. And, and I will just have two slides on it and not much more. But, uh, let's say uh, such films, of course, are being deposited on, on, on a substrate. Typically for uh, these films, because they are relatively thick, uh, the lattice mismatch uh, between the, the material grown and, and that of the substrate is such that in this thick film, you get uh, strain relaxation. But since we are dealing with different uh, materials, silicon, for instance, or other materials uh, with respect to the, our oxides, so PZT, there is a, a quite huge uh, difference in thermal expansion. Uh, you, we deposit at high temperatures, let's say 600 degrees C or so, you have to cool it down. And then of course you have a different thermal expansion. So the, uh, there is a misfit strain in the film. And then depending on which material you use as a substrate, you can either have compressive strain, like in the middle of this uh, plot, or um, uh, let's say have uh, more uh, tensile uh, strain. And we studied that uh, already many, many years ago uh, using different types of substrates, which you can see over here. So ranging from silicon to, uh, to, to oxide uh, substrate with different thermal expansion coefficients. And we clearly can see in X-ray patterns uh, uh, and, and also reciprocal space map that we have a different, um, let's say, uh, crystallographic properties of the PCT. And uh, if you now then go into the, the properties, we can clearly see, and, and here you can see the, uh, the polarization uh, loops, you can clearly see a very different behavior of such, uh, let's say, uh, ferroelectric materials uh, in, in, on top of these uh, substrates. So where the piezoelectric properties do not change that much, the polarization is quite different. And this has to do with the different symmetries in these materials. So if you grow it on silicon, you have much more polarization in the plane and therefore also the polarization loop become different. Whereas if you do it on strontium titanate, which is the blue one, then you get a much more square loop where the polarization is pointing out of the plane. 
So this is very important. And, and with this, uh, and we did many, many more studies, uh, please uh, look into literature there, uh, uh, where we actually tuned composition, but also strain in such a way that we can optimize uh, uh, the functional behavior of these thin films in device uh, geometries. Very interesting was also uh, that we nowadays can also grow PZT and, and, and other oxides, uh, by the way, on, on 3,5 uh, substrates. So in this case, it's gallium nitride. Uh, this is a collaboration that we have with other groups within the electrical engineering department, but also some companies where, um, for instance, for uh, uh, high power uh, applications, so field effect transistors, uh, these are being used, for instance, in, 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 in to control the batteries, etc., uh, but also in, in other power applications. There, you really want to have a device that if you have a, a transistor in the on state, it should have a very low resistivity because high currents are flowing through such a, a device. You also want to apply that very high voltages. So that also means that the breakdown voltage of such a device should also be very high. And that's schematically given in, 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 the, in the figure over here. Now, gallium nitride uh, itself uh, has all, also a breakdown, can break down. And actually, if you typically uh, would look at a device, a, a uh, device like uh, sketched uh, here in the bottom, uh, if you apply these high voltages, then uh, the, the spacer layer uh, underneath uh, the electrodes might break down, and this causes then a limitation for the use of such devices. Well, people have thought about uh, workarounds there. Um, you can see the schematic of uh, uh, such, a, such a breakdown where it would uh, happen in, in the, for instance, the LGAN. Well, people have thought about uh, ways to, to, to do it. And, and the, the more, most easy way is to place a, a high dielectric material on top of the LGAN, which kind of um, changes this uh, electrical field pattern such that it would not break down anymore at this uh, gate uh, over here. And um, well, there are many materials, of course, that show high dielectric uh, uh, properties. And uh, we know that uh, our oxides that we worked on, like uh, barium strontium titanate or lead zirconium titanate, have very high values of these dielectric uh, constants. And that means that if you would be able to grow such materials uh, in, the, in, the, in the best way on top of this LGAN, uh, then you would have a device that could be operated at very high voltages. This is what we have been doing. And we have been, uh, uh, well, we, 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 we talked also a lot with John Paul Maria at that time. He uh, showed that magnesium oxide epitaxy or gallium nitride is, is possible. Gallium nitride, of course, has a very different uh, crystal symmetry compared to our proskites. But if you look uh, carefully, if you would grow it in the 111 direction, uh, you can grow it epitaxially, although with a very high misfit. You also have to deal with a non-oxide and an oxide material. So there is a, also a different chemistry related here at this interface. And it was shown by this group um, that you can grow magnesium oxide on gallium nitride. And we also tried it. And actually, it works indeed. And we also showed that you can grow PZT epitaxially on top of that. So and this is uh, shown over here. So uh, here you can uh, see in, in the middle uh, picture, you can see a atomic force microscopy image of, of magnesium oxide being deposited on LGAN, and you can see the imprint of the of the gallium nitride uh, actually. So these uh, facets over here is uh, from the from the substrate, and uh, uh, you can also grow a piece of T epitaxially in the one 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 direction on top of such uh, magnesium oxide, and you can see also from the five scans that it is indeed uh, epitaxially grown. We have also shown that we can lower the thickness of such uh, uh, magnesium oxide buffer layers down to a single monolayer. So even a single monolayer is enough to transit from uh, gallium nitride to magnesium oxide, very thin, to PZT. Well, we have made devices out of it. We have shown that you can uh, uh, have ferroelectric uh, behavior of this PZT with high dielectric constants. And also, uh, uh, we have checked the epitaxy here for a somewhat thicker magnesium oxide layer. So the, the bottom part is uh, gallium nitride, 
and the middle part is uh, magnesium oxide and the top part is uh, PZT. And you can clearly see uh, uh, an epitaxial relation where we still do not understand the uh, epitaxy of the oxide on top of the algan because um, let's say this is not a coherent uh, uh, growth on it, as you can see, because uh, 19 lattice uh, uh, periods of the uh, gallium nitride fits with uh, 20 or so of the, of the uh, magnesium oxide. But still, uh, this is um, uh, epitaxial growth. And uh, we also checked uh, uh, with uh, uh, EELS uh, measurements, so where we checked uh, the, the uh, composition at these interfaces, and we actually could see a very uh, small region between the gallium nitride and magnesium oxide or the PZT and the magnesium oxide, where we have interdiffusion. Actually, uh, this is going to the limit of the, our electron uh, microscope. Um, and here you can also see the, uh, uh, the, the, um, the in-plane lattice parameters, which was determined from these uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy images. And you clearly can see jumps in the in-plane lattice parameters. So the material is directly relaxed on top of it, and, uh, but still have an epitaxial relation. Does it work? Yes. So we made the first devices there. Uh, we have a, a high, a very high breakdown voltage over here using this uh, uh, PZT on top of that. And actually, we have, and this is the configuration as shown over here. So actually, this this seems to work quite well. And we have now a PhD student that is looking into uh, uh, fabrication of these devices with also other types of um, epitaxial relations with the gallium nitride. So this was 111 oriented, but now we can also bring it to 001 and, and 110, etc. And we are looking into this uh, many more. Then I would like to uh, uh, jump to uh, uh, a final application, which I, I always like uh, very much. You might know that we have a company in the Netherlands, ASML, that is uh, uh, making uh, uh, lithography tools for the, uh, for instance, the CMOS market. So all major foundries uh, within Samsung or uh, TSMC or global foundries and others all have uh, ASML tools to go to, uh, let's say, uh, 10 or what is it, 30 nanometer resolution uh, for CMOS uh, production. And um, we have been working together with them and with Zeiss uh, to work on the next generation's uh, uh, lithography tools, where uh, uh, if you look into such a, such a, um, a tool, of course, these, these are huge tools, but uh, if you look inside, uh, if you go to 30 nanometers or even below, you cannot use standard optical elements anymore, so you need to have uh, Bragg reflectors in it. And of course, these Bragg reflectors have aberrations, and you need to control these aberrations or being able to manipulate the aberrations uh, while uh, uh, using the tool so that you do wavefront correction. So, and this is a zoom in of such a, a complex uh, system. So if you would be able to change the wavefront of one of these mirrors, then you would be able to adapt, uh, let's say, this complete system such that you can still uh, have uh, the high resolution as needed in, in, in these tools. Yeah. And there are a few ways to do wavefront correction. One easy way is, uh, and this is actually what we did, is to wavefront correction. So if you could build uh, uh, pistons underneath this Bragg refractor in such a way that you can manipulate this top surface, let's say a few nanometers, you, you would be able to do a wavefront correction already. You can also do reflectance tuning if you have two Bragg mirrors that you can uh, change the, the position in between. And of course, most optimal would be that you do wavefront, wavelength tuning, but then you need to control uh, the individual distances in the Bragg reflector. And, and still imagine that these layers are only a few nanometers thick. And that's of course very difficult. So in collaboration with other groups at the university, Zeiss and ASML, we have been working on wavefront correction there using PZT. So this is the stack. So the mirror is uh, made out of uh, uh, molybdenum silicon. Uh, uh, we did not work on the complete stack yet, but what we were able to do was already to uh, build a piezoelectric uh, stack underneath uh, such uh, materials and show that you indeed can move uh, up and down these uh, multi-layer mirrors in a patched uh, version, like sketched uh, on, on the left, uh, where you can change, uh, for instance, a single patch over here in a different way than the, uh, another patch that is next to it. And with that, you can change the, the, the wavefront of these materials. This is quite complex already. 
But the most important thing here is that these mirrors are on top of glass, this ultra low expansion uh, glass. Uh, and this is an amorphous substance. So how do you get epitaxy on top of such an amorphous uh, substance? So we used uh, a trick uh, 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 using uh, uh, nano sheets. So these uh, uh, the, the sheets that we used are kind of the oxide equivalents of graphene. Uh, and we mainly use calcium niobate uh, nanosheets. I cannot go in too much detail how we fabricate them, but we can make these nanosheets and by a Langbeer blotchet type of deposition, we can deposit these sheets on top of a substrate. Here you can see individual flakes uh, of titanium oxide, um, uh, uh, manganese oxide and uh, calcium niobate. And uh, here you can actually see that indeed we have single, uh, uh, let's say monolayer, uh, sheets, or not monolays, but uh, uh, nano sheets of these uh, calcium 2 nobium 3 o, o 10 And uh, by, uh, well, increasing the density of this, we can fully cover a, a uh, substrate. Here you can show uh, that you can do it with the Langbeer budget uh, type of deposition, where here you see AFMs of uh, an almost, uh, let's say, completely covered uh, surface with these uh, nano sheets. And we have shown already in the past that uh, we can use these nanosheets to grow epitaxial layers on top. So here is a, a schematic view of strontium ruthenate on top of these uh, nanosheets. And indeed, uh, we can show that these are epitaxially grown on top of these nanosheets. Now, this is a somewhat busy slide I will walk you through. So here we used uh, 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 calcium niobate nanosheets deposited on glass. And on top of this, uh, we deposited the PCT. And clearly you can see here this, uh, this, this piezo of these uh, uh, polarization loops and the uh, piezoelectric uh, properties there. And uh, we did that at several temperatures, so ranging to typical temperatures, what we typically use, so 560 and 600 degrees, but we can even lower it to lower temperatures uh, below um, the, uh, uh, sorry, I have to click. Where am I? Here, yeah. Sorry. Um, so you can even lower the temperatures to 450 degrees C. So that also makes it compatible, for instance, backend compatible for CMOS. We clearly can see this uh, epitaxial growth there. And in the bottom pictures, you can see uh, the, the remnant polarization, because it fields, uh, but also the, um, the piezoelectric properties. And while the maximum piezoelectric properties are at, uh, uh, at uh, the higher temperatures, Still, there is a very high piezoelectric effect in the materials that being deposited at 450 degrees C. Well, uh, we have checked uh, morphologies of these materials on top of these uh, uh, on glass and silicon. We, uh, uh, we also compared it with uh, silicon and glass. Here you can see, uh, um, um, let's say interference, uh, uh, white light interference uh, measurements. And you clearly can show that we can change the height of a, uh, of a, um, uh, a patch uh, by applying a voltage there. This is this depending very much on, on, the, the, on the thickness of these, uh, of these layers. And, and, and be aware here, we are talking about real thick films. So typically we are used to 10 or 100 nanometers. This is up to five microns. Uh, that is necessary for such devices. But uh, this, this really, really works. And does it work? Yes, it does work. Um, so at the right-hand side, you see some pictures with white light interferometry, where we, and this is a, just a model where you can see uh, patches. Uh, and we, if you apply several uh, voltages, you can see that we can create different patterns uh, in these uh, thin films. And therefore we can use this uh, to wavefront correct uh, uh, such uh, materials or, or such such mirrors uh, in the end. So um, hopefully uh, I, I will stop here. Uh, hopefully uh, I've shown you, let's say, uh, give you a bit of a flavor on what we are doing. Uh, PLD uh, is a fantastic technique uh, uh, if you control it at the atomic scale with electron diffraction and, and uh, make uh, very crystalline materials. But nowadays, these materials also find their ways in applications, in sensors, in actuators, but also many others. So uh, uh, let's say photonics, uh, quantum uh, applications, et cetera. 
And uh, for real applications, we need to integrate such materials with other materials like silicon, like glass, uh, three fives. And this is uh, actually also, you can do that with uh, pulse laser deposition. And with that, I would like uh, to thank you. And I hand over to the organizer. Hello? Yeah. So did that. We can't hear you, uh, Sandeepta. Hello? Rick, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm waiting for some detail. Otherwise, um, we can also uh, pick it up. Some detail, can you? <laughs> so maybe we can take over by looking at the chat if yeah. there's a question. Yes, exactly. So are there any questions for the talk from Gus at this point? And feel free to unmute your microphone and ask the question directly. That's not a problem. I think if that's possible within the Zoom. Yes, uh, so Professor Gus, uh, sorry for the little technical delays. No problem. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for the nice uh, uh, presentation on the very complex material. It is really nice to know, and uh, with a very short time, I think uh, many of us must have been gained some knowledge on the on the growth of complex materials. So and now, now I think Professor Boos is getting late, so we can uh, uh, say goodbye to him. And if Rick, you have some time, then we can do a little question and answer session. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I can stay on. Yeah, sure. I see many many of the questions are actually. Uh, the, quite technical of, of nature, so I'm happy to- uh, Yes, there are, That's fine. there are uh, quite a few questions. Yes, so, and we can rest up the rest of the uh, queries, we can uh, reply them individually. As we, we, we got all the email IDs, we can yeah. Yeah. reply so, them uh, if, if necessary, if necessary, uh, please do not hesitate to send me an email. I, I'm uh, I'm happy to answer the questions also through email. So if any, anybody of you has a uh, has a uh, still a question, please do not hesitate to to uh, reach uh, me uh, through email. All right. All right. And uh, then uh, let's say the Have discussion. Fun. Bye. Perfect. Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Bruce, for a nice time. Have a nice day. All right. Yeah, if you can uh, organize this a bit, uh, Sandeep Sao, then... Uh... So, Rick? Yes, I can read out a few, few of the questions. Uh, yeah. One question is that, uh, 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 what is the optimum distance between target and substrate? Is it at the edge of, of the plume or within the range of plume? That's a good question and a very long answer, actually. So. It's, um, I guess it's clear that the plume is a, is, a, is a complex thing and it changes over over distance in terms of the, the composition. So at every point where you would check, uh, let's say between target and substrate, you would actually find a different composition because species are, depending on the pressure conditions, but let's say in, in high oxygen pressure, there is significant interaction of the expanding plume with the background, so species slow down and they tend to oxidize depending on, on the material. So at any point where you would start collecting the material, you get a different composition and a different kinetic characteristic. And having said that, there is essentially no, I guess you get the point that there is no optimum. What I know is for instance, for the, the, the yttrium uh, barium copper oxide 
um, IGC uh, synthesis, they actually found uh, that just by visually looking in, in the chamber, they saw that you, you see the plume when you see PLD. So they actually uh, knew that the optimum position was exactly where you kind of didn't see the plume anymore. That's not very scientific, but it, it does say something that, uh, okay, what does this position mean? And it actually means that um, although you don't see the plume anymore, the species are still there. And uh, well, what, what does it mean that we see the plume? It actually means that species are radiating light. And it means that they're, therm that they're not thermalized. They're, they're, ex they're in an excitation state, so they're, they're hot. But it, during interaction with the background gas, the species slow down and they cool down. So they're still there. So arguably, especially at the high oxygen or high pressure, thermalization happens. So you could question whether you're still talking about a plasma or actually just kind of an expanding gas. For YBCO, there was the optimum. Just put it at the front of the plume. But again, that's, that's not very scientific. It says something. And probably it says that species need to be thermalized. They need to lose most of their energy, kind of soft landing, and then uh, nuclear. But, but that's just specifically for such a material. I mean, there is so much literature about this, this topic. People find that in some cases, you actually want species to arrive with a high kinetic energy because they actually transfer this kinetic energy and they actually they, they hit the substrate with a high velocity and therefore kind of breaking up initial islands and therefore smoothing out. Um, what I personally saw in my work is actually you needed this oxidation. Species should not arrive as a neutral or as an ion, but as a as a monoxide. Uh, this was the case for strontium titanate, for instance. So material dependence, there is. Yeah, there is such an optimum to find. Depends also what you mean by optimum, right? And that's defined by whatever properties you're looking for. So long story. Uh, practically, the, the target to substrate distance is an important parameter in the PLD process. And what I would say, to some extent, you can exchange it with pressure. Because if you go to a longer target to substrate distance, this is kind of the equivalent of working at a somewhat higher oxygen pressure because you 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 travel through a longer um oxy oxygen environment so what i would do practically is don't change the target to substrate distance because it's one additional parameter in the process so just fix it at typically 50 55 millimeters and and tune all the other parameters to find your optimum that's yeah, again, long story short, a lot of work on this. And it, it, yeah, you yes, should it really is for, a, complex. for every target, it needs to be readjusted. Adjust, yeah. So we can take one more question. Uh, it is from Dr. B. Uh, Rajesh Kumar. Uh, his question is if any uh, polymeric substrate used during the deposition process, mm -hmm. And then how will the plasma affect the polymeric substrate? I, I have no experience in doing that, actually. So th that would be one to put on an email, and we can maybe discuss uh, with the, the group here. Uh, polymers, uh, the right. growth, right. and okay. the I, uh, my apologies, but I, I have no experience there. And then one uh, very interesting question. Uh, why uh, performing a read measurement is not successful? Successful by every company. Only a few companies uh, are there. Was there any specific technique required? Could you repeat that? Is it in the chat or? Uh, yeah, yeah it is in chat. Uh, why performing a read uh, measurement is not successful by uh, every company? But what exactly do you mean by this? When is it not read, successful? It means read, read integration. Read integration. I yeah. Say. So why it is so challenging? Why is it, sorry, you, 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 the audio well. you, Why it is so challenging? Um, yeah, so again, so I, I of course don't know why some co companies fail to integrate. Um, it's mainly the, the considerations. I mean, uh, we we get our uh, electron guns from, from Stipe. We've developed this high pressure read which mainly is, is, is the engineering part, having a differentially pumped part and um, introducing the, the electron beam through a, a pinhole very close to the substrate. This is a piece of engineering, which works in our case. And uh, you need to have a, 
a heating stage again so it's all about sample alignment with respect to the electron beam so the the the, the, the heating the, the sample manipulator needs to be able to move the sample in all necessary directions to align the crystal axis to the electron beam um you need to take in mind any electronic issues or if you start heating you're putting current uh if, if you do resistive heating for instance not laser heating but resistive heating you're putting current through a filament which might affect the electron beam you need, need to make the right provisions there you need to make many provisions to prevent uh vibrations and electromagnetic interference and yeah i i, I can't speak for for other other parties, we, we simply know that uh, uh, our, we, we still, from customer to customer, we are surprised by uh, finding ourselves in having to solve uh, another issue with read because of things that we actually didn't think about or uh, are just part of the lab. I mean, even if, if, if an electronic circuit in, in a lab is unstable, this can, can backfire the electronics of the read gun, and therefore you have an unstable uh, read signal. And these are, yeah, so because it's so sensitive, um, we're making all sorts of provisions, but still you, you find yourself sometimes in having to troubleshoot at the customer side because, and, and so- Every, every site has some different uh, issues and different- uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and we we, ad we advise the customer in terms of lab preparation, but but again, like so, it, it's still so sensitive. We had we had an incident in I think sw uh, Switzerland or uh, Austria where uh, a passing by um, um, metro line was actually causing magnetic interference. Um, so we had to shield the yeah. whole chamber with magnetic shielding. It's ridiculous and f a funny story, but. Um, it's, it is not not trivial. I think we are. We'd like to think it's already kind of trivial because it's part of our system designs, but it's not. It's not so easy. And again, also from a user perspective, um, doing good read studies also as, as a user using the system and and controlling the knobs. Uh, it's all about sample movement, high control of sample movement, and this is what we integrate in our systems. And I think, and this makes the stage more elaborate. Therefore, maybe arguably, uh, not. A, not, not cheaper than having a super simple system, but it's the way we, uh, we'd like to do because in the end, it's serving good read studies in the end. You want to have nice data to, to publish. And uh, now we make our provisions in our systems designs uh, accordingly. So. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So we can take one more question. Uh, so I got uh, a message from uh, one of our customer that uh, yes uh, so pld is very successful in doing the oxide and nitrates mm -hmm. how about doing uh, the samples like uh, mercury telluride uh, tungsten selenide yeah it's it's for these 2d uh, materials the, the, the only thing i can say because also this i ha don't have personal experience in growing these films but more and more people are doing this so there is a there is a demand and probably a lot of literature you already can find uh, likely you find yourself in very different parameter space uh, because it needs to be super clean typically um, uh, ultra high vacuum uh, that's mainly done the, the, these materials need to be super pure um, tend to be metal like ablation so much higher energy densities on the target which is in our case really just moving around the optics so the machine is definitely capable of, of going to the fluent ranges that are required to do these type of ablations um yeah so the, by heart i don't know but but it's a developing material field um, yes the, and, actually and the, 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 issue, the issue is uh, what the customer is explaining that uh, regarding that uh, uh, temperature part particularly so you need a, a particular temperature to oh. given to the substrate where yeah Targets require a different temperature quality in growing the films. Is it correct? Um, could you repeat? So you you have the temperature of the heater, temperature of the targets, and that might interfere. Both. For... The, the, yes. Yeah. Uh, that the uh, tar and that uh, substrate uh, require a different temperature to. Uh, different temperature and target required a different temperature so how to address these two temperatures yeah so it 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 only becomes a problem when it becomes a problem so for complex oxides 
um, it's not it's not a commonly seen issue, right? People just he heat their samples to 900, 1,000, 1,100 with laser heating, and they work with these pallet targets, and, and it's, it seems to be all fine. Uh, I also saw the question in, uh, in the, when the laser hits the target, how much temperature it can produce. Yeah, so these are, it's really difficult to, 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 to quantify. I would say, I mean, heating up a target, you're already talking about really high temperatures where the surface of the target should uh, reconstruct or so, and therefore really ab affecting the ablation because the, of course the ablation process itself, the, the temperatures are, are, are tens of EV. So tens, tens of thousands of degrees uh, initially in that, in a point. So, but it's super local. So in the end, there's not much heat being transferred into the, the, the target because it's ablation, you ablate the whole, this, this whole part. So there is not much temperature going into the target from the ablation process, but it does warm up by heating the substrate because it's quite close by. Yeah, I think in the end, it's just kind of a, a practical, silly argument. You just have to find out whether it's really affecting your target. If so, you could think of target cooling by uh, having a cooled, uh, a water cooled kind of design. Uh, to which you put your target, right? So that's just a, and it does, that's definitely not something we uh, continuously produce or so, uh, but but that could be a customized design um, if, if really necessary. Yes. Now, uh, it, it's, it, it becomes the thing yeah, when, so, I mean- Okay, I'll... No, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay, so uh, one more quick uh, question. Uh, did you have any idea uh, that the material LSMO or yeah. Yeah. PSMMO. Yeah. How much material? Yeah. This is question, this I, question asked by yeah. Mural Anonymi. Yeah, yeah, I know. So Alice and I have been growing myself, uh, also on um, in a stack where we started to grow on, on silicon, uh, where we work with buffer layers and LSMO is a bottom electrode. Um, you can really consider it as being kind of a conventional metal oxide, and then the the, the fluid. It's it, again, it's 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 fluence, so laser energy. That's what you're referring to. Um, to basically, so every everything. And it's, it's, it's an optimizable parameter, but all these complex oxides tend to have an optimal fluence between 1.5 and 2.5. So two is always a good starting point. Um, going down somewhat uh, decreases the growth rate, but also arguably, but you need to start somewhere. And what I always would do is, is I mean, it's a parameter you want to optimize. So growth, grow three films at 1.5, 2, and 2.5, and invest get it see what the morphology he does uh, uh, see what the properties do uh, get a feeling for wh yeah wh what what is kind of the optimum i wouldn't go into a super detailed uh every tenth fluence or so but but it should be around two that that's a, a standard uh, for um uh manganites titanates manganites yeah okay the questions keep on coming. <laughs> yes, we can take one last question. Oh, it uh, is fine. Uh, uh, can you suggest the glue which sustain high temperature to fix no. the substrate on heater other than no. silver paste? Uh, yeah. the silver paste has magnetic impurities. Yeah. So uh, I know, yeah, so I've, I've worked with, with, with platinum paste. I don't know about any magnetic, so I might be saying something very silly, but uh, platinum paste is mainly used for uh, going to higher temperatures where the silver uh, starts to evaporate, basically. So every, everything above nine, what, what is it, 964 or so, then uh, the silver paste doesn't really work nicely. And there are more types of um, thermal pastes, also kind of uh, carbon-based, I think. Uh, don't have yeah you, clamping would be just just don't use any paste but with any clamping solution you're losing um, a homogeneous temperature distribution and arguably also maximum temperature but that depends on how, what temperature you are interested in so clamping no you're suggesting titanium paste you're suggesting titanium paste 
No platinum. So yeah, platinum base is a bit platinum different. But, but I don't know on the magnetic uh, whether you run into also magnetic issues there. Magnetic. Since uh, Anupama is asking that uh, the silver paste has magnetic impurities. So yeah, but it's, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I mean, so. Right. This it's silly, uh, but you say you also should be very careful, right? So don't use it, a lot of it. And um, I, I know people tend to see responses or not. It's it's always kind of, uh, and we still advise it because it's it's definitely not a um, a very common issue with the silver base. So still many people use it, and still don't. Mean, but it also yes, most on most of the people most of the people use this uh, silver paste. Yeah, 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 yeah. But. It, but and again, it also depends on the properties because you're looking into it. So, platinum paste, maybe. Yes, I, th I think that they are they are working they are working on the magnetic uh, materials, yeah, yeah. Uh, so they are more concerned about uh, the magnetic impurities. Feels to me that maybe a, a clamping kind of solution would be most interesting because it's, it will be a thing that you actually don't have to worry about anymore. But that depends on the, yeah. on, the on the temperature you need on. The that's right. So, one more good question you can take. Does the target need to be ground and uh, uh, pelletized before every deposition to ensure smoothness of surface? Yeah, so I don't exactly know what you mean with pelletized, but, but uh, ground and pelletized, you mean um, sandpapering, this type of preparation? Uh, um, I mean, so so okay. It's it's just a very simple, practical way of practical way of thinking. Uh, you want to start with a clean surface to to ensure reproducibility. Might cause phase separate because okay, you put a lot of temperature locally in the target, which might causes um, which causes. Um, uh, let's say a liquid, a liquid formation uh, temporarily, and that might result in a phase separation kind of um, effect, especially with wrong the wrong fluids. Uh, you, you might get funky effects. This is actually an interesting point. So, so practically, you should not only optimize your fluids by focusing on the properties of your film, but you should also look at the target itself. Uh, if you go to too low or too high fluids, you might see very funky effects on the target, actually. Uh, as I mentioned, phase separation. So um, an outgrow of a certain metal oxide, uh, which isn't transparent or is transparent for the UV light. Um, the, the, this, essentially, the surface of the target after pulses should just simply look very nice, smooth. You should really see kind of a hole in the target with, with, with a smooth surface. So you know you really ablated everything. So fluids optimization is actually not, maybe it's as important to look at the target as the, the, the film that's being grown because you the starting point is a, a very homogeneous, concurrent ablation of all the material that's that's there. And there is also a fluids optimization. Um, and again, so if you want to ensure run-to-run -run reproducibility, uh, occasionally you want to simply sandpaper the target to have a smooth uh, surface uh, and put it back in uh, in the system. And general remarks, uh, especially with powder targets, uh, try to get it as dense as possible uh, because otherwise if you have, let's say, small microscopic holes in the target, you get heat dissipation there. You might uh, ablate chunks of material, uh, the, 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 the classic, issue with PLD is particles in the film that often arise from, from big chunks of targets being ablated because the target density is too low. So always discuss with the suppliers, you need high density, high purity targets um, and optimize yourself by, by sweeping fluids. Just make a few pulses, move the target, make a few more pulses with a different fluence and ideally check it under a, a scanning electron microscope. So really investigate the surface of the target. That's about it. Okay, so I think we can take uh, one final question, if we're okay, Rick. Uh, when the laser hit at the target, how much temperature it can produce? I think. Uh, yeah, I kind of won't, won't be discussing it. So uh, it's extremely. Yeah, I, I, we we have actually we, is... we did some. 
it's not much. We we did some measurements by putting a thermocouple inside the targets because we we uh, we also have a, a machine where we can grow on silicon wafers, a large area. So there's a lot of ablation because you want to cover a bigger area, not mm -hmm. a small sample. Uh, so we we were wondering about this effect and we didn't see any significant effect. And that's really down to the ablation mechanism, I would say. There was a lot of heat going into, but it's going into the ablated material and not so much than subsequently leakage to the, to the target itself. And it's also, I think, a matter of, uh, the, I mean, the, 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 yeah, the quite small. So that's not, it's, it's mainly the, the, the general heating up of targets, I think, by heating the substrate. That's the main issue. For, for ablation, you need to think of other things. So what more yes. often? Yes. I think your 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 video is freezing a bit and your connection. Are you still there, uh, Sandeep? Though? Yes, yes, I'm I'm still here. Yeah, you're connecting <laughs> slightly. <laughs> okay, so I think we are uh, we have answered uh, most of the queries. Uh, as there are, there are a few more queries, we can I can address them individually. Yeah, sounds good. So, so thank you, thank you for your uh, valuable time, Rick, and it was a nice in presentation as well as interaction with. Uh, and there are quite a good number of people is there in in, in, in the meeting. I'm sure yeah, they, must have, they, they must have learned a few good things about the PLD techniques. Happy to hear. Again, we're open to any questions. Contact us. Go to our website. Um, for a yes. technical question, obviously, uh, if, if you're interested in, in any project or whatever. Uh, also, just stay in touch with Latent Science um, um, as being our uh, representation in India. So, so yeah, thanks. Uh, did, 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 thank you, thank you, everyone. And if you have any queries uh, related to the PLD and any laser related, any sorts of laser, as you know, we laser science has uh, more than 20 principles. In our portfolio, we have a simple diode laser to complex femtosecond lasers with us. So if you need any sorts of information on any laser or photonics related items, do contact us. We'll be more than happy to address everyone. So thank you everyone. And uh, we always want to see you once more. And if you plan something in future or some other topic, we'll definitely uh, push up some uh, publication and advertisement and we will like to you see again sounds good thank you bye -bye. thank you everyone bye bye have a nice day to bye. everyone